We've been looking at the cross these last few weeks, trying to explore various levels and different layers of what happened at the cross. That word, that phrase that Jesus says, that we just read in John's version of the crucifixion, it is finished, Jesus says. So, but what is finished? What has been done that never has to be done again? What is it that is accomplished at the cross that we can hold tight to and our faith is grounded in? What is it about the cross that stands for generations and millennia now as a symbol of God's great love for us? Something happened at the cross that once and for all has been done. And over these last few weeks, we've been peeling back layer after layer for to fully understand the marvelous mystery of the cross takes way more than just one message, one sermon, one weekend, maybe even one lifetime. For there are layer upon layer of things that have been accomplished for us through the cross. And so what we've been trying to simply understand is that the various layers of it invites us to a deeper adoration and worship of Jesus, the Christ, the one who is hung on the cross for us. It's just way more than just a, a death of a person on that brutal Roman cross. It was way more than just the death of a religious leader along the way. There was something cosmic that God is establishing and God is accomplishing through the cross that never has to be done ever again. It is finished, Jesus says. So what is finished for us? So this morning, I want to use John's understanding, Jesus' words in the Gospel of John, to understand what is he about to do as he interprets for us all the events that surround the crucifixion. So I'm going to read for us John chapter 12. So if you have a Bible with you, John chapter 12 is where we are, starting in verse 20. John 12, verses 20 through 32 is kind of our centering passage this morning. And we're going to look at it in in some depth here this morning to what Jesus is explaining about what he's about to do, what he's about to accomplish that only he can accomplish that is for all to see. So John chapter 12, verses 20 through 32, it's on the screens. You can follow along there as well. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethesda in Galilee, with a request Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there heard it and said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. And Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. This is Jesus now explaining to this group of people who have come to know him what is about to be accomplished at the cross and through the cross. And what we will see is the, the cross is God's glorification. It is the glorification of the character of Jesus, of God. We're told now that there are these non-Jews, these Greeks, 
John says, but that would mean that they're non-Jewish people who have come to Jerusalem to worship. They had come, they had seen Jesus ride in on that Palm Sunday on a donkey amidst all the shouts of Hosanna and the palm branches being waved. They'd seen him go into the temple and drive out the money changers. We had seen this Jewish man care about non-Jewish people to have a place within the temple to worship, to not be taken advantage of. And so he drives out those that are taken advantage of the people that had traveled, those money changers. And he'd seen this Jewish leader, this rabbi, care about non-Jewish people. So they come to Philip and they ask him, we want to see Jesus. We want to know a little bit about him. It wasn't just they want to get close to him and get his autograph or anything else. They want to know him. They want to know what makes him tick. What's his character like? They want to know this one who cares about non-Jewish people to have a place to come and to worship. They want to understand him a little bit. So they come to one of his disciples and say, I want to know Jesus. And so he goes to the other disciple and they bring him to Jesus. They say, Jesus, they want to know you. They want to know what makes you tick. They want to know what's, what you're about, what's your, what's your passion about, what your purpose is about. So Jesus gives this response to who he is and why he has come and what is it going to be accomplished in just a few days on the cross. And is that this response that we see four key terms that I want us to consider and how we explain, how we understand what's going on at the cross. Four key things that Jesus says in this response to people who say, I want to know you. I want to know what what makes you tick. What is your reason for coming? There's four things that Jesus says. And as I think we consider them, my hope for us would that our eyes would be expanded and our our understanding of Christ would deepen just at least a little bit. At least a little bit more adoration and worship and awe of the one who was hanging on the cross some 2,000 or so years ago. That we would know one more layer of what God is accomplishing at the cross. The first term or the first phrase for us is this phrase, lifted up. Jesus says, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. It's clear from Jesus' teaching, it's clear from the book of John, it's clear all the way through the scripture that this refers to Jesus' death. That when I am lifted up, when I die, the, the sacrificial death on the cross, I will draw all people to myself. But it's deeper than just his death. It's deeper than just the way in which he would die, this this crucifixion kind of death. But he's leading or he's, he's referring to something that happened in Israel's history, a specific moment in Israel's history where something else was lifted up in Israel's history. Jesus says it this way to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man, referring to himself, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him, the Son of Man, may have eternal life. Jesus is referring not only to the way in which he is going to die, but he refers back to a specific event in Israel's history that they knew very well, and that this One would be lifted up, and if anyone would believe in the one lifted up, then they would have eternal life. This event in Israel's history, Moses leads them out of slavery, out of captivity from Egypt into the desert. And we're told in the story that the people began to grumble and complain and be bitter against Moses and against all of their issues that they were facing. The book of Numbers actually tells us that their fiery snakes are sent into the people and among the people. And whenever they were bit by these snakes, they would die. So Moses prays to God and God instructs him to make a replica of this snakes or of these snakes and put it on a pole and place that among the people to place it there. And if anybody was bitten, then they would turn their eyes off of their situation, off of their stuff that they were experiencing and turn their eyes and lift them up to the one that was lifted up. And when they did, they would be healed. They would be healed. It was a way of turning their attention off of their situation and onto God for healing. 
So the term lifted up, when Jesus says that I would be lifted up, he's not only talking about how he would die on a cross, literally lifted up, but he's also drawing our minds back to the healing power of God through Jesus. That once and for all, there will come one who once and for all can bring healing to this land and to us. So not only does Jesus on the cross pay our ransom, not only is he a substitute for our sin, not only does he deal with that which separates us from the living God, but he brings the power to bring healing to our lives and to our land itself. The ramifications of our sin and the trappings of our sin and how we live under that weight through his death on the cross, we can be healed from a life of sin. That through Christ, we can experience victory over patterns of sin and addiction along the way. That through Christ, real healing can occur in our relationships, in our marriages, in our physical bodies, in our life together. Through Christ, he provides the power of healing. That is good news for us. Jesus says, if I am lifted up, when I am lifted up, Anyone who turns their attention and draws their strength from me can find healing in their very lives. Physical, relational healing in our very lives. He says, I will draw all people to myself. Because what draws people to God more than anything else is the work of Christ on the cross for us. He is resurrected. We talk about his birth. We talk about his teaching. We talk about his ministry, resurrection, ascension. We talk about all of that. But what draws people, what what brings them close is the work of Christ on the cross to bring healing, to bring reconciliation, to bring forgiveness. Why? Why does the cross draw men and women and young people By the hundreds, thousands, millions. Why the cross? Why the brutal death on the cross? Why does that draw people to God more than anything else? Well, I think that's the second phrase I want us to consider that Jesus says. And it's the phrase glorify. Glorify. Jesus says that the hour has come for the Son of Man, meaning himself, to be glorified. That somehow, in a mysterious way, the cross of Jesus is his glorification. You see the glory of God on display at the cross. On the cross, Jesus is glorified. To be glorified means that the substantial character, nature of God is on display and honored. That his nature is on display for everyone to see. And it's highly honored. For there's like a a weightiness, there's a substantialness to the character and the nature of God that is on full display, highly honored through the cross. And that is what it means with the cross is that he's glorified. He is glorified on the cross. Jesus says that the time and the hour has come for the entire world to see all of the weight and the substance and the realness of the character of God. And when we see God for who he is, the proper response will be honor and adoration. Jesus says, it is for this purpose that I have come. Father, glorify your name. Put your character, your name, your, your way of living, your way of being on display to be honored. To which the Father responds in this thundering voice, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. I have glorified it. How has God glorified his name, made his character on display, other than the life and the deeds of Jesus, the works of Jesus? For whenever Jesus is doing his works, he claims that his works are the works of the Father. So his deeds done in mercy and forgiveness, turning the water into wine, bringing newness out of that which was old, healing the sick, touching the leper, bringing sight to the blind, casting out demons, raising Lazarus to death, the, the new from the old. All of this is God's work and all of this is God's character on display. He has glorified it in the works 
of Jesus. What we see Jesus doing is you see the character of God on display. The one that brings life, newness, out of oldness and out of death. All of Jesus' life, all of his ministry, his teaching, his works, all of it has been to glorify the Father. Put his character on display to be honored. All of Jesus' life. And yet there is one particular moment, Jesus says, where the divine glory, his character, his nature will be on display in full view to be honored for what it really is. It will be clearly evident for everyone to see. And Jesus says that that one particular moment where God's name will be glorified, his character will be on display and honored, will be on the cross. The cross is the glorification of God. Which brings me to the third phrase to consider. And that is the phrase, the hour has come. Or the hour is here. Jesus says that the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, for the display of the character to be on display for everybody to see. And if you were to trace through a little Bible study and trace the word or the phrase, the hour has come, or the hour, all the way through the Newer Testament, in particular the Gospel of John, which we're reading this morning, then you will find that it almost always exclusively relates to the death of Jesus. Religious leaders are up in an upheaval because Jesus is teaching all these things and they come to try to seize him, to get him, but the scripture says they could not do it before because his hour had not come. His hour had not come. Jesus is at the party, the wedding at Cana, and his mother comes and asks him to do this miracle. And he says, but my hour has not yet come. It has not come for me to put on display the full character and nature of God to glorify. It has not yet come until finally, in the triumphal entry to Jerusalem, amidst all the shouts of Hosanna and the palm branches laid down, Jesus finally says, the hour has come. There is a particular time and moment for the glory of God to be on full display for everyone to see, to make no mistake about it, The not yet is now. And then Jesus reiterates that two more times in the upper room, just as Judas leaves to, to turn him over to the religious leaders. He says, the hour has come. Son of man will be handed over to those for crucifixion. And then in the Garden of Gethsemane, moments before he's, cruci- moments before he's taken away to be crucified, he prays and he says, Father, I know the hour has now come. There is a particular time in history and moment where the glory of God will be on full display, where the violent people will come and take their, take their, lay their hands on Jesus, and that time has now come. So if you put those first three phrases together, what you get, the Gentiles want to know what we want to know about Jesus, about who he is, and he responds that the hour has come, the time is now fulfilled, where me, the Son of God, the Son of Man, will be glorified where God's essential character and nature will be on full display, upheld for everyone to see, and will be lifted up. And for anyone who turns their eyes to the one who's lifted up will experience healing of their life, of their relationship, of their spiritual life, and will experience eternal life. The death of Jesus on the cross is not just a death of some human teacher that lived 2,000 or so years ago. It's not just the death of some religious leader that had some ideas of things. The death of Jesus on the cross is the moment where the nature and character of God are most fully on display for all to see. That is what is finished. The character of God is now full on display. The nature of God is now fully on display for all to see, to glory, to honor. And whenever we catch a glimpse, even a glimpse of that glory, then the proper response is honor, adoration, and humble submission. Humble submission. Which brings me to the final phrase I want us to consider. And that is a grain of wheat, Jesus says. 
He says, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears fruit. See, Jesus is using this analogy to speak of his own life and the purpose of his death. He says the hour has come, the moment has finally come for God's essential character, nature to be on display for all to see. And what we see in God's essential character and nature is the self-denying action of death. Self-emptying, dying action of God. God says the grain of wheat only lives if it dies to self. It fulfills its very reason for being when it gives itself away. Death, and if it doesn't die in death, then it just exists alone and ultimately unfulfilled. But the secret of Jesus' identity, of his purpose, of his character, of his nature, and the identity of the Father and the nature of God himself lies in the nature of self-giving self-emptying. So when Jesus comes to live a servant life, it's not him giving up his divinity. It's not him giving up his divine nature. He doesn't cease to be God because he's the servant of all and he's self-sacrificing. He doesn't cease to be God because he's hanging on a brutal Roman cross. Rather, he learns and he lives a self selfless life, a servant life. He gives himself to the most brutal death on the cross because that is the most appropriate way to manifest, to put on display the very character of God. For self-giving love is at the very heart of God. And that's nowhere ever clearer and then perfectly revealed to us in Jesus on the cross. Self-giving love of God fully on display. That is why the cross is the glorification of God, the divine nature on display for all to see. Nothing ever has to be added to that. It is finished, perfectly seen in Jesus, the self-giving one. The hour has come, he says. That time has come for me to be glorified to put my essential character on display for everyone to see. And you will see it when the grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies. Because Calvary reveals the truth about what it means to be God, the very character of God. And it invites us to embrace what it means to be fully human. To be fully human. Because Jesus in this grain of wheat analogy goes on to say to us that we will find our life when we find our life caught up into the ways of God. Particularly in the self-giving love of Calvary. When we find ourselves living into the way of Jesus, we will find our life, our true life. Jesus says those who want to love their life, cling to their life, demand their life will ultimately lose it in the end. But if we cling to our life, if we try to hold on to our life, he says we're destroying them. Why? Why are we losing and destroying our life if we cling to our life and love our life on this side? Because clinging to our life, demanding our way, is actually violating our very nature. How we have been made. How we've been redeemed. We are image bearers of God, made in his image, in his likeness. And we find our life and our life's meaning and purpose when we follow in his ways. So not only does Calvary demonstrate the very character of what it means to be God, but it invites us to what it means to be fully human, most human, when we are faithfully walking in how we've been made. We are most truly ourselves when we empty ourselves, giving our lives away in self-giving love, when we follow the way of the cross. See, if you cling to your life, protect your agenda, your careers, your reputation, and along, along the way, insisting that everything be done our way, then Jesus says we lose because you're violating the way in which you've been created and redeemed. On the other hand, when we learn to give our lives away, self-sacrifice, death to ourself, then we win. We actually learn to live. We live by dying to ourselves, 
Jesus says. We learn to love our neighbors, sacrificially serve those who are forgotten, abandoned, left on the other side, to care for those that the world just easily discards along the way, to find ways to give ourselves away, to bring healing to people, physical healing, to meet them where they are and to bring physical healing to them, to bring emotional healing, to bring reconciliation and forgiveness to relationships, to give ourselves to that endeavor. Because what is seen perfectly at the cross that never needs to be seen or said again is the glorification of God, the perfect self-giving love of God that brings life to that which is old. So these Gentile Greeks come looking to Jesus. They ask, I want to know you. I want to know what makes you tick. I want to know your character. I want to know your life, what it means to be you, what it means to be God, what it means to be a life following after your ways. And so Jesus says, okay, you want to know? You want to know what it means to be my character? Then now you're going to see it. For in just a few days, you're going to see what God is all about. You're going to see what lies at the very heart of the universe. You will see the, king, the secret of the kingdom of God. You will see it all displayed perfectly on the cross. And he will say, it is finished. Here and only here you see the perfect demonstration and glorification of the nature of God. And now that you've seen his glory, now that you've seen the glory of the one and only Son of God on full display, the invitation for us is to turn from our self-looking or our self-interests to turn to look and to walk in the ways of the cross. To be cross-shaped people in our life and in our life together. So as we kind of wrap up this morning, I just want to invite you to think, what would your life look like if your life was cross-shaped? A life shaped by self-giving love, of loving my neighbor, loving my enemy, praying for those who are persecuting me, to love those who are forgotten, to care, to bring forgiveness and mercy, to bring a listening ear to somebody, to bring healing to them. What would your life look like if it was cross-shaped and you turned from self-interest to the interest of Christ on the cross? Because as you look at Christ on the cross, you see the glory of God the demonstration of his eternal qualities, perfectly revealed in self-giving love. What does that look like for you and for me? We find our life when we see the glory of God and we follow in that way. Let me pray for us and for you. Jesus, we are humbled that you would come for such a time as this. And that you would lay yourself down in full submission, surrender to the will of the Father. And that you would put on display your character that we may see who you are. Give us courage to walk in your ways. To learn how to live a life that is cross-shaped. For it is in that kind of life that we find our purpose and significance. We ask this in your name. Amen.